Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a 25-pound plate, and we'll go out on the turf, and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Rob McKeefer, and this is episode number 281. I want to thank you guys for listening each week. Truly appreciate those of you that like, share, comment. Just helps us continue to highlight the great people that we have in our profession. I uh, also want to thank our sponsors, and specifically Samson, for bringing this episode to you for free. I only partner with people that I, uh, companies that I believe in both the product and the people, and uh, Samson does a fantastic job. So if you're in the market, please reach out to them. If not, just let them know how much you appreciate them being a part of the show. This week, it's truly an honor to be joined by uh, a legend uh, in our game, you know, Coach Johnny Parker. Uh, Coach Parker was one of the first people to uh, respond to me when I was getting into the profession. Um, you know, I sent out 281 letters, and uh, Coach Parker was one of the few that actually responded. And uh, just thank the world to him. But, Coach, I, I truly appreciate you coming on the show. Coach, thank you so much for having an interest in, uh, in me and having me on your show. And, Coach, I would say that I'm number 281. I, that's about the highest I've been on any list. <laughs> no, no, you were really right. honored. No, it was, uh, it was one of the early, you know, early things I'd sent out. Back then it was letters, right? And, and uh, you were one of the – I think we had – I think I had maybe 15 people respond, and you were one of the first. So, um, but, you know, you, you've been, Coach, you, you started off 10 years in the collegiate level. Uh, and then 21 years in the NFL and with the Giants, the Patriots, the Buccaneers, the 49ers, um, you know, you've pretty much done it all. You've been to, I think, five Super Bowls. Is that right? Four. Four Super Bowls. Um, but what I want to find out, rather than kind of go into each of those places, which, which one of those stops was most impactful to you and why? Well, uh, uh, Coach, one thing that you did mention was that I spent five years as a high school coach in Mississippi ah, that's at right. the beginning of my career. Right. And, Coach, those kids would, in the summers, would work out in the fields from, they called it, from candle camp. From <laughs> the first time you can see <laughs> till you can't see. And then instead of going home, they would have their clothes and maybe some sandwiches or something in their pickup truck, and they'd drive straight to the school there in the dark and run and lift weights. Wow. And any good things that have happened to me are the direct result of, of those kids. They, they've always been my heroes, and th those kids uh, made me look a lot better than I really was. So that's – undoubtedly the most impactful thing and i would say this coach that anybody who at any point in their career was ever a new york giant beginning middle end it doesn't matter when their career is over they consider themselves a giant and that's because of the merrill family yeah the, the merrill family it's personal and it's family to them and it's not just business no oh, it's awesome that's awesome. Well, Coach, you don't, you don't have uh, that successful of a career without making some mistakes along the way. What's, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've made and, and how you learned from it? Oh, my gosh. Coach, how many days do you have for me to answer that question? <laughs> we, I, I, we, we all put up a bunch of podcasts with that. <laughs> Coach, I think the, the first big mistake that I made, and it might have been the biggest, is when I started teaching and coaching my first year out of college, I thought the kids needed a friend. Sure. And from I was by far the most popular teacher in the school for about the first six weeks. So I realized there weren't any of them doing what I was telling them to do. And it was, you know, Coach, you know this. You can always lighten up, but you can't tighten up. Yeah. So all I could do was survive that year. In class, I was poorly prepared. Um, I was an assistant junior high coach. 
And about my main function was to be the finish line for sprints. That was about all I could attribute. <laughs> you would then, go, right? When me, coach, it gets worse. I was a <laughs> eighth grade girls basketball coach, and, and our first game – we got beat 51 to nine. <laughs> and coach, there were four six minute quarters, and he pulled the starters at halftime. Coach, he could have probably put close to 100 on us in 24 minutes. Wow. That's how bad that I was. And just fortunately, fortunately, and this might be a topic for, for another time, but a little seventh grade girl named Cindy Courtney changed the entire direction of my life. Wow. Not just as a teacher or a coach, but as a person. And those I that changed everything about about my life. And I'm so thankful for that. But I would say that's probably the biggest mistake that I made. And then coach like maybe a few young coaches, I just thought you're supposed to work them hard. Yeah. And I thought if they couldn't if if they could walk right when we got through with the workout, then I probably hadn't worked them hard enough. Sure. And of course, you know, I mean, you and I both know now that that's wrong. And maybe you never made that mistake, no. but I sure did. And and coach, there were a lot of kids who got better in spite of me, and not because of anything that I was that I was doing to help them. So, yeah. coach, I would say that. And probably the third thing was this, that I thought, you know, you're supposed to yell a lot and holler and growl. And, and I didn't realize, luckily I learned this pretty soon, but it's, it's a lot more important to make the kids feel special, to make them feel important, and to make sure that they know that you're invested in their success, that you're in it with them. You know, that, that, that you're in a – and, Coach, you, you know this. We're in a service profession. Right. Kids aren't there for us. We're there for them. Luckily, I learned that one, you know, fairly quickly. And instead of yelling at the kids, you know, I would try to yell encouragement. Right. And speak softly when I had to get on a kid. Absolutely. And I think that was I, that was a pretty important step forward for me. Yeah, I think I mean every one of those mistakes I think most coaches make. It's just how fast you learn them is to, you know, dictates how much success you have. I think. Uh, but I That's mean, a you great know, statement, coach. I'm, yep. Ultimately, it's it's absolutely you know you got to get away from chasing the logo and chasing your own personal ambitions. And when you focus on the kids and you make the kids the hero, a lot of times good things happen to you. Coach, isn't that the truth? Coach, here you're getting a, I'm getting a lot more from you than you're getting from me. That is a great, great statement. Is uh, we're in the business of making kids' dreams come true. That's what it really is. And you and I have chosen the, the tool of weights to do that or, or running or jumping. But coach, we've got the kids' dreams in our hands. And that doesn't matter whether it's a junior high kid or high school or college or NFL. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Helping folks' dreams come true and then helping to teach them the values of loyalty, teamwork, discipline, sacrifice. Those things, I think, are, there's no question, those are what last. Absolutely. And even if they're not able to take those values into a professional career, in in the co- in this class that we're teaching them, or in the sport that we're coaching them in, still those principles lead to success, no matter what you choose to do with your life. Agreed, agree, one hundred percent. Coach, you've been in the business, you know, you know what, thirty six years, um, so, maybe more I'm than that. Path is bad. Our <laughs> <laughs> coach for I think. Nearly 40 years, I think, and I've been re- kind of semi-retired for 10. I do a lot of volunteer work with yeah. kids, and then I try as best I can to help young coaches right. over the phone or at their place or mine or whatever. That's fantastic. Well, you've, you've seen it all, I think. You know, you've seen this, this field grow. You're one of the pioneers of the profession. What, what, what is some of the 
What are, what's some of the good that you see and, and what's some of the bad that you see currently in the profession? Well, Coach, there's the thing that just drives me nuts are these guys that are on the sideline act like a village idiot. <laughs> now, men like Alvin Roy, Lewis Rickey, and Clyde Emmerich, they were the true fathers of our profession. Right, agreed. And they were gentlemen. They didn't have to act like a, 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 the court jester or a complete fool. And to see after all the years that they put into it and our generation and your generation have put into making this a respected and valued profession, to see guys act, make complete fool of themselves on the sideline just drives me nuts. And I, I can't stand it. I hate that. I hate that. We're trying to help the kids become the show, not become the show ourselves or draw attention to ourselves. You know, the position coaches, the head coach, they don't act like clowns. Right. The trainers, the doctors, they don't do that. Why do we strength coaches have to be the one to put on a completely embarrassing exhibition on the sidelines? Agreed. You know, with, with a lot of those guys <clears throat> that, you know, that, that that's coming from, some of it's, you know, just what they do, but a lot of them, it's something that's expected from them by the head coach uh, or team leaders or whatever it may be, you know, throughout your career, I'm sure, you know, coaches have come to you and have asked you to do things that maybe you didn't agree with. How did you, you know, how do you handle that with, you know, with the fact that, you know, they can replace you at any time, you know, that's a, that's a fine line of, of, um, you know, I, I want to keep my job. I want to do a great job, but I don't always agree with the head coach. Coach, is you know it's easy for me to say now that I'm retired and but coach I'll tell you this at the end of the day I had to face myself I had to live with myself I was not going to compromise my principles or my moral values for anybody right. you know there was a, a coach that I turned down a job from because they cheated in recruiting I wasn't going to be a part of that. Right. Would not be a part of that for anything. Coach, we have an obligation to set a moral and ethical example for our players. But then I understand about coaches want the you know, this these displays on the sideline. Well, what about the what about the coaches having the players so prepared to play? Right. That you don't need that. And coach, you know, emotion doesn't last. You can have intensity all the time. Emotion is a passing thing. And right. coach, you know, he could go, he could go hire a circus clown, but I ain't doing I would get excited. I'd get very excited on a sideline. Right. But not in a way that was drawing attention to me or trying to become the, you know, the center of attention. And I can remember a coach that you might know that never did that either. And as a matter of fact, I'm talking to him right now. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, you let your you let your players play be your statement. Right. Yeah, I think there's there is such a fine line between, you know, being having emotions and passion and and and, and letting that ooze out of you to some degree. But like I think what you said earlier, where it becomes about you and your display versus the player's display. I mean, they're they're the show. They're the, they're the reason why you're there, and you know you can get them fired up without taking attention away or or, or putting it on yourself. And I think it, it ultimately is a selfish thing. It's not a it's not a team thing. Which football football is the ultimate team sport, you know. And I think the the way that young coaches need to try to prevent that, in my opinion, is. When you're interviewing, and so many times you go into these interviews, and you just you just want so desperately to have the job that you're willing to take anything. That's that's your time to interview that head coach, also, you know, and that's your time to lay down like, hey, look, you know, this is me, and if if you don't like the way that I am, then I'm not the right guy, and and I'm interviewing you as much as you're interviewing me. Um, and that's and that's what I started doing later in my career is, you know, I would tell them that I'm not going to be that dancing clown. You know, I'm not, I, I, it's not me. I'm going to have the guys ready to go. There's going to be anybody that has more intensity on the, you know, in the organization than me. But 
um, at the end of the day, that's not, that's not me. That's not who I am. And if any time that I'm not being authentic to me, uh, I'm not being the best version for our team. Hey, Coach, that is so well put. I wish I wish I had a notebook out here with me. I'd be taking that down. I, I couldn't agree more, Coach. And I, I think that instead of listening to me, coaches need to be hearing you. No, because that. that's no. that is gold that that you're giving to the to the people that are going to watch and listen to this. No, I appreciate that. What do you, What do you think is good? I mean, what have you What are you, What are you excited about and proud about as a profession at this point? Well, well, Coach, I think this. I think that our coaches today certainly have access to a lot more knowledge than we had. And really, there's so much knowledge out there that a coach has to be pretty discerning in picking through what is valuable and what isn't. Yeah. Um, I think that coaches have to be very careful of this. Make sure that you just don't have facts, that you have wisdom and how to put those facts together. And, Coach, uh, one thing that is very exciting to me is when I go into a weight room or, or visit with a coach or talk to a coach about his program, and he tells me about their free weight program. You know, Coach – you know, I'm a lot older than you. Shoot, I'm a lot older than dirt. But, <laughs> you know, they've been trying to replace free weights with isometrics, isokinetics, Nautilus, Exergenies, uh, hammer machine. Free weights are still standing after all of those attempts. So to see coaches that have gotten away from machine-based training and all of these gadgets – that don't work and are doing cleans and squats because those are the exercises that have been shown to yield results in, in any sport that I know anything about. Right. That, that really fires me up to I see agree. that. Yeah. I think there's, you know, I mean, obviously there's tools and you got to have a lot of different variety, you know, in your programs to keep your athletes stimulus, but the, the, the core of your program needs to be centered around, some of those foundational lifts, like you're talking with the clean and the squat and, um, you know, deadlift and whatnot. So I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Well, Coach, by the way, one thing, excuse me, I hope I didn't interrupt. Not is at all. The one thing, Coach, is that in my whole career, the biggest weight room I ever had was something like 36 or 3,800 square feet, I think, my entire career. Well, Coach, now these weight rooms, you need a Rand McNally Atlas to get around in them. <laughs> and, Coach, in five years, they're going to tear it down and build another one that's even bigger. No, I, I built one of those. Coach, I like to be able to be hands on and eye to eye with my players. And I, I, I just think that we there's a good chance that we lose something by having such big weight rooms and having – Coach, I was talking to a high school coach that's got 44 half racks in his weight room. Yeah. You know, players need to work together. Yeah. They need, you know, like three guys, at, at, you know, at each place. And then, you know, maybe when you get through, you go to another place and you're maybe working with other players but to, to build camaraderie, camaraderie and teamwork. And getting to know the you know the other players on your team, and you see how hard they're working. So, I understand about these big palatial weight rooms, but coach, I I would kind of rope some of that off and say, all right, stay out of there. That's for recruiting. We're gonna get our work done right here in this little area where absolutely. I can coach you. I I absolutely agree with that. What a what, what advice now, you know, you've got, you know, the, I, I spoke at a clinic, at, at an NSCA clinic a couple of years back. You know, there's, it was a big round table. There's, you know, 400, 500 coaches in the room. And I, I had everybody stand up and I said, you know, sit down if you can't name more than five strength coaches that have retired being strength coaches. And the entire room sat down. You know, it, it's just a profession that there hasn't been many coaches be able to go start to finish and retire. They've even got him out. They've done completely different professions. 
um, they get frustrated, whatever it may be. What advice would you have for the young strength coach to be able to survive, you know, all the ups and downs of this profession and get to a point where they can uh, retire and not just retire, but also retire in, in a good position with their health? With, with, oh, with. Coach, I would say this, that, well, first of all, you know, in the colleges and NFL now, they're printing money. That's <laughs> true. Sure. It is incredible. The, the, you know, the salaries and coach, I'm not jealous. You know, there are coaches now that are making double and almost triple what the most that I ever made. But coach, I made a multiple of what Alan Roy made. And I coach, I'm not even, you know, I couldn't even carry his weight belt. So it, that's just the way of the world. But coach, I would say this, coach, max out on your 401k or 403b. I don't care what, max out. But then, Coach, that's just part of it. Because right. you do that and you look, okay, boy, I've got a thousand dollars saved. In a few years, yeah, man, I've got ten thousand. I've got twenty five thousand. No, you don't. Because in those tax deferred accounts, you've got about two thirds of that. Right. And when you retire and you say, man, I've got, you know, umpteen zillion dollars. No, you don't. You've got two-thirds of umpteen zillion dollars, and it goes a lot faster. When you – now you have to pay taxes on it. So save money in, in accounts that you've already paid the taxes on. Right. Also, I would say this. Is it find a conservative money management company? Uh, Coach, I can recommend, I, I don't know if this is improper or not, but Vanguard. They yeah. manage several trillion dollars. They are the low cost, lowest cost of any you know, major money management company. And, Coach, they will not deviate from their plan. If, 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 if you've got your money invested with somebody that is buying and selling individual stocks, you better run for cover. Yep. Because nobody can time the market and nobody can can hit home runs on individual stocks. Great. So Vanguard only puts your money in not only funds, but sometimes funds of funds, and they diversify you so widely that anytime something falls, then another category then is taking its place. Sure. So, Coach, now I know that Warren Buffett borrows money from you, but that's, that's my little two cents worth <laughs> right there. <laughs> that's absolutely not true. But I would, I would, what I would add, and I agree 100% with, is not just diversifying in your, in your retirement fund and, and, and whatnot, but diversifying in your, in your streams of income as well. I mean, absolutely. Coach, coaching is one, but if you add, you know, uh, maybe maybe you do a little real estate on the side. Maybe you do a little um, camp or write a book or or something along those lines. Getting some things that are, are going to bring some additional income in that and you're saving that money. Yeah, you're stocking away. Absolutely, I think it's so important because there are whether you like it or not, there are moments of transition in this profession, yep. and if you're not prepared for that, you're that's that's when you're forced out. You, you, if you do leave, you want to leave on your own terms, but you never want to be forced out of the profession. It's something that you've worked so hard that you love and passionate about. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, that's, that's great it. advice, coach. That is, and I tell you, coach, I, I was lucky enough to be in the NFL pension program that is a heck of a pension program, but you live, it doesn't start till six months after you retire. Right. Well, coach, in six months, <laughs> you know, you, especially since you, if you're moving and all of that, coach, you knock a chunk out of your savings. So you, you're exactly right. Be prepared for those periods of transition. You, uh, one of those things that you did is you wrote a book. You just wrote a book called The System, you know, and, and uh, did it with uh, a couple of co-authors. Uh, what was, I mean, I, I I always talk about on the show that there, everybody, every strength coach has a book in them. You know, they have something in them that they should share. And, and being in the 
being in the first hundred years of this profession, we have an obligation to document it as much as we can. So everybody should try to put something out for sure. But, um, but you guys, you know, put a, a great resource. I'm actually about, you know, four or five chapters in now. Um, and it's fantastic. Talk a little bit about the motivation for writing the book, you know. Okay. So, first of all, my co-authors and my mental superiors by far right, were Al Miller and Rob Panarella. Right. Hey, Coach, those two guys, I don't even want to get started on them except to say that not only are they professional peers, but they are the two of the best friends you could ever have. You know, if you've got four or five friends, real friends, you're lucky. I don't know how many I have. I know, but I've got them. Yeah. They are the, you'll never meet better, more loyal people on this planet. They are, are students. They, I always been retired for a number of years. He is a student today. Uh, Rob is the best physical therapist in America, but he knows strength training as well as anybody. Now, Coach, some 28 years ago, we found that there was a Russian weightlifting coach, Gregory Goldstein, who immigrated to the United States. And luckily for me and for Rob, he was right on our doorstep at Staten Island. I was at the Giants then. So Rob and I started going to see him at night after work. Or we would go to the Jewish community house in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, where he worked. And we just filled notebook after notebook after notebook with, with things that this man was teaching us. And then, you know, Al Miller is my, as a pure strength coach, you know, he was my best friend in the profession. And so I wanted to make sure that Al knew about Al to show you how dedicated he's always been. He would fly in from Denver on weekends to have seminars with Mr. Goldstein. Yeah. Fly all the way from Denver to New Jersey. Now, if you wonder why Al Miller is a great strength coach, there, there's just one example of, of, of why. But Mr. Goldstein told us this 28 years ago. And you would think, okay, well, surely, you know, you're writing a book about it now. Hadn't people then tried this? and maybe had success with it, but gone on to something better. Coach, over this time period, we've looked. Nobody does this. It's not that people have moved on from it. People have not moved on to it yet. Sure. And we three agreed that it was the best technical thing that we ever learned, is this system of how to – mathematically vary the volume of our training. And so, Coach, it's, it's in all the Russian literature. I didn't recognize its significance as I would read you know, Bud Shonigan's translations. But so, Al and Rob and I just felt that we needed to leave some gift behind to people that you know, we might never meet, that we'd never know. You know, we have, um, what I do now is I, I spend a, a good bit of time volunteering with kids, and I spend a good bit of time on the phone, mostly, with young coaches trying to help them as Alvin Roy and Lewis, Ricky, and Clyde Emmerich helped me. Sure. That's my, give, that's my gift to my three main mentors. And... This is, I guess, this book you can say is our gift to our profession. And, Coach, again, it's technically it's the best thing that we've ever learned. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's fantastic. And and uh, I made a post about it the other day. Um, I think if if people are are are, are interested, um, what what's a, what's a a Reader's Digest summary of the book. Well, Coach, considering that Rob and Al are so much smarter than I am, I about Reader's Digest is, is is the best I can do. But, Coach, you know, so often in in strength training or conditioning or jumping, 
it's a big enough problem to figure out what to do. But then a bigger problem is even is what to do next. Yeah. Clyde Emmerich told me that when he was a world record holder in weightlifting, that they would try a routine, and if it worked, they would milk it until it stopped working. And then they would say, okay, well, anybody got any ideas? Well, let's try, say, five, four, three, two, one. Well, they would try that for a while, and you know, and it, then it might not work. So they would ditch that and then try something else. So what this concept of training does is helps us quantify the volume of our training in such a way, <clears throat> excuse me, that you don't ever get overtrained. And it allows for much longer term progress because of the built in recovery and restoration. Yeah. And, you know, coach, I used to think, oh, you got to go hard every day. Well, you don't. You know, coach, think about this that, you know, you, if you think about life as a bell shaped curve, well, over here on the far left, when you're born, you can't walk. Then you get up that left side of the curve a little ways and then you can walk right then you get up to the top you can run then after a while you start down the the right side and you can walk yeah, right. and then when you get down in the fourth quarter and overtime you know you can't walk right well a what we're trying to do and what mr goldstein told us is that the object of training is one to make the peak of that curve much higher right. and much broader. Sure. To be at the can run phase, you know, where you're at the peak of your physical powers, be a lot at a higher level and to last much longer. And so for the the coach, the biggest problem that a coach would have is deciding what to do. Then once he decides what he wants to do, because we we certainly have sample programs in there, but right. we don't tell a coach that he has to do what just what we say in terms of programs. But the principles are that's the key to the whole thing. Yeah, are the principles of numerically waiving the volume month by month, week by week, and day by day. So that the athlete, one, never does the same workout twice, never does it twice, period. Right. And then his body can never predict what it's going to be asked to do the next workout because there's going to be change. Now, Coach, you asked Rob Panarella or – Really, any physical therapist that deals a lot with athletes, and they will tell you that maybe maybe twenty percent at most of the injuries they treat are related to intensity. Sure, that is too much work, or, or I'm sorry, too heavy work. But over eighty percent are due to overuse or to too much volume. You know, it's like this, Coach. You can't live without air, but you can blow away in a tornado or a hurricane. Can't right. live without water, but you can drown in it. Tennis isn't bad, but too much tennis is because you get tennis elbow. Right. Just as an example, you know, weight training is great, but you can't go hard every day. So, Coach, once you decide, Coach, and this really helped me, is Mr. Goldstein taught us that there are really seven categories of exercises that have enough effect on the central nervous system that you really need to account for them in your planning. And that's snatches, cleans, presses, squats, jerks, pulls, and posterior chain exercises. Of course, in say in football, you have to do neck. But right. it doesn't stress your nervous system enough for you to need to count that in your volume. All sports need to train their abs, but you can train abs really pretty hard every day. So sure. you don't count that in your volume. 
And then, Coach, then after you decide what you want to do, then you apportion, we, tr- we calculate a month at a time, you calculate or you determine how much of a given exercise category that you want to do. So, for example, I think cleans and squats are the most valuable exercises for football. So when we analyze our program, we better be doing more of those than anything else. So we assign a numeric value to the different categories of exercise. So, for example, some people don't do snatches. That just means you get to do more of the other six categories. That's all. Sure. So, and then, Coach, in this book, and I'm not trying to hide anything, it's just um, there is a plan in there to tell you how to apportion the reps you decide on. Just to make it easy, let's just say you decide that I'm, I'm looking at programs in the past that you've done that you like or things that you want to add or do different. Let's just say you come up with a thousand reps for a month right. that you will do. And then you determine, say, cleans might be 18%. Squats might be 20%. That's not written in stone. That's up to you as individual coach. But then, coach, with a 1,000 reps in a month, the first week you are allowed to do 27% of your volume for the month, 270 reps. Then the second week, 22%. 220 reps, third week, 300, I'm sorry, 32% or 320 reps, the fourth week, which is an unloading week, 19%, where so volume and intensity are reduced in the fourth week. Right. And then, Coach, if you're training four days a week, the days mirror the weeks. So Monday of week one, 27% of 270. That's how much work you can do Monday, Tuesday, 22% of 270, et cetera, et cetera. So once you decide what you want to do and how much emphasis you put on each category of exercise, then it, it gets a lot simpler. And I promise you or any coach that after you do this the first time, it is so much easier in succeeding program designs so yeah. much easier absolutely yeah i think i mean again i i, I talk a lot on the show about sharing you know sharing and and um what you guys are, are doing with this is fantastic and, and, and especially in, in program design so much of it is so much of it is an art you know but it is rooted in science and it is rooted in mathematics and 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 having a system to be able to uh, make that process simpler um, is definitely welcome for sure. We we end the show, Coach, with some resources. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. Oh, boy, Coach, you know, I've been lucky to be around and to work for so many good co-coach, Bill McGuire and Bill Parcells and Bob Knight and Mike Nolan. They, they influenced me as coaches more than anybody. I would say probably this. Decide what you think is important and don't ever compromise on it. Because if you do, you'll never get it back. Great. Now, whether that's toes on the line, shirt tails tucked in, whatever is important to you, Coach McKeithry, or to Joe Smith out there, if it's important to you, do not ever compromise. Absolutely. Because then you, you've lost it. And the only way you can get it back is by changing jobs. It's true. And even then, <laughs> once you uh, you concede on things, sometimes it's hard in general. In general. What about a, a book, app, website recommendation? You may, well, not, you may not see jobs on the apps, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coach, here's the thing. As, as I've told you, you know, I'm, I'm not Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. I am just now getting into this, but I'll tell you this, Coach. I, uh, 
you, you can count on one more member or subscriber, or whatever you call it, to yours. And I'll tell you a mistake I've made is not getting to know you better over the years. That's a big mistake I've made. But, Coach, I'll, how about this, Coach? In, instead of a particular app, since I'm not knowledgeable enough about them, I think a coach has to decide what he believes in and spend, once you've decided that, then I think you need to spend about 90% of your time learning how to do that better and 10% or 50, whatever percent examining new ideas. Great. So, Coach, I would say that one app or no, it's a website, uh, you know, Bud Shartiger's site, Dynamic Fitness or Sportivity Press. Bud has got a lot of good articles and translations in there. But, but Coach, that's really not fair because I don't know. Yeah. But I'm going to know. That's a good one. That's a good one for sure. Any books that, you, that you've read through the years that, you've, that have been impactful? Coach, you know, the best book on coaching I think that I've ever read was Instant Replay. Jerry Kramer was the right guard for the Green Bay Packers. It was his diary of what turned out to be Coach Lombardi's last year with the Packers. Really? To me, there was more in that book about how to be a leader of men than any book I've ever read. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I've never heard that one. What was the author's name? Jerry Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm going to check that one out for sure. Well, Coach, like I said at the beginning, I mean, you've been so impactful to so many in this profession, myself included, and um, and the fact that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're continuing to give back even, um, as you said, in semi-retirement, I mean, it just shows the type of character of person you are and, and um, both the, your success uh, in the profession um, and your heart for helping coaches just as a, as a guiding example of what we should strive to be in this profession. So thanks so much for everything you've done. Uh, for the profession, thanks so much for everything you've done for me and, and appreciate coming on the show, Coach. Coach, thank you for having this old broken down, old uh, has-been washed up straight coach on your show. I do appreciate it, Coach. Thank you so much and continued success to you, Coach. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.